This is Isaka's Page 2 Podcast. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm John Brandt, Director of Professional Practices and Innovation here at Isaka. Joining me today is Data Privacy Manager Muneeb, author of Pakistan Cybersecurity Policy in 2021, a review. Muneeb, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, John, for having me. If you wouldn't mind just taking a couple seconds, just uh, tell, tell our uh, viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself, what you do, and, uh, and some of your background. Yeah, so I uh, started my career with the telecommunication organization. My Most of my career has been, uh, you know, from the telecommunication background. And then uh, once I switched towards the cybersecurity uh, side, then I have worked uh, with the financial sector, with the government sector as well, and also with the telecommunication sector. My role is has been largely around consultancy services, where I have uh, provided the consulting and the advisory services to various clients around information security and privacy and uh, having you know uh, having helped those organizations to establish the cybersecurity uh, within their organization and uh, set up their complete strategic roadmap uh, and uh, you know guiding them through about uh, what needs to be done when it needs to be done how it needs to be done on a very high level because uh, uh, my my forte is more around uh, governance risk and compliance so this has been my uh, my specialized uh, area of focus, and uh, right now I'm working with uh, one of the organization uh, in the Middle East, uh, which is from the financial sector as the data privacy manager, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that that's about me. Perfect. Well, I tell you what, I always get excited when someone else has experience in the telecommunication sector, and. Uh, you know, it, it it just goes to show that not a, no two people really end up in this industry the same way. So I really appreciate um, your article and everything that we're going to dive into today. If you would, if you could give some context for our listeners uh, about the cybersecurity landscape in Pakistan and and some of those uh, the main challenges that were driving uh, this policy that came out. You see, the first thing is that we, we need to understand that. Uh, a, this policy came very late. It should have come much earlier. But that does not necessarily mean that the understanding or the realization within the various governments was not there in the in the yester years. I'm, I'm quite sure it was. However, what happens is that when a country is embroiled in some kind of an economic crisis or in the macro challenges around governance, what happens is that security essentially gets pushed back to the back burner. And uh, also one of the reasons I think was because of the government sector still relying on their conventional ways of doing business. And the digital transformation was not really taking place uh, uh, you know, in the yester years. In the past 10 years, the digital transformation has taken place. But again, security you know, still remained on the back burner. Reason being that uh, you know, when you have bigger challenges in terms of the economy, then you obviously care less about the security aspect. Think of it like this, that, I mean, if I'm able to, if I'm barely able to make my ends meet, I would not think about putting the CCTV camera in front of my house because I'm, I'm barely able to make my ends meet and, and, you know, feed my family. So, I mean, it does not make sense for me to have the CCTV and the all the security apparatus installed to just, just protect me. At the end of the day, I mean, what am I protecting? And even if I may, I might have something which is valuable. The point is that uh, if uh, I'm, you know, if I'm earning very less as a country, if we are earning very less as a country, then we have to be very cautious about where do we spend that money, whatever we are earning. So I think this was one of the reasons why uh, the policy got, uh, you know, you know, it was pushed onto the back burner. Uh, However, because of the increasing digital transformation, because the government is now trying to, you know, automate the systems and trying to move towards the digital infrastructure as well, the private sector has already moved much, uh, you know, faster in comparison to the government sector. So therefore, the government had the compulsion also, uh, you know, to look into this area. And therefore, I think this was one of the reason, uh, you know, it, it, it prompted the government to uh, take cybersecurity policy in a more, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, in a, they, they were more concerned about it with, with the 
passage of time and also the fact that in past few years pakistan has seen cyber attacks and also it, pakistan has has seen uh, you know various data breaches what happens is that basically when you uh, uh, you know uh, when you do not have even the minimum security or you know cyber security in place then you are essentially then your assets essentially become the low hanging fruits for everyone else and this was uh, the case uh, with the private organizations and with the government sector as well and therefore i am of the view that this prompted the government to you know chart out this policy uh, and uh, so therefore they they released a consultation draft earlier and then they had the final uh, policy approved and published by july 2021 Well, very good. You know, a couple things takeaways there is, you know, I would challenge the thinking. It's it's easy for us to say that the policy was late, um, but at the same time, the reality is is that we also, you know, there's lessons learned from others, right? And and to kind of take that into consideration as to. what was working and wasn't work you know what was and was not working in other locations one of the things my takeaways when i was reading the article and i and, and i actually think it might actually set pakistan up for a little bit more success is the of the ability that the policy was written to affect both public and private sector right and and if you look at different you know regions and countries united states you know for example governmental makeup and and influence and construct all kind of influence what you can and can't do um to, but your point when you're trying to solve a lot of different problems it, it it is a huge challenge and we see this repeatedly over the last several decades where individuals just tried to uh, quote unquote bolt security on right and it never works you know that i know that um So I it's promising that there's stuff there and I you know your insights which we're going to continue to dig on are very um I think they're spot on personally and and I'm optimistic that that there's a feedback mechanism and you had mentioned in there and I'm I'm just going to jump over to another quick point here because I think one of the things that's going to could make or break this policy is this um uh, cyber a uh, governance policy committee right the the cgpc like any other um body government you know advisory body or what not they're only as good as the input that may or come or come you know come in or not so you know what are your thoughts on that preliminary thoughts do you know anybody um that is that's interested in that you know i i know i think in your article you had said at the time there was no one actually appointed to it has that changed in the last couple months unfortunately we have not heard about uh, you know the progress uh, related to this uh, however you know one of the reasons i think why uh, the cgpc is going to be constituted is because uh, you know this cgpc will be uh, providing their uh, you know their recommendations to the federal cabinet and so therefore it needs to have people with the expertise and the experience with the, from the industry side to guide the uh, to guide the government however uh, there are still blind areas there are still blind spots which need to be addressed by the government in terms of uh, who will be the members of this organization how often are they supposed to meet to which ministry are they supposed to report to and uh, who's going to head this com- this committee so i mean these uh, these mechanics are still left uh, you know unaddressed this is still not uh, you know these details have not been shared by the government as yet and we have not had uh, any any further news on this one as well let me ask you something cuz i i actually don't have a whole lot of familiarization with with the pakistani government and some of the challenges or nuances i should say um with any advisory committee like here in, in in you know the United States lawmakers they don't know what they don't know and so what we have found is that there are um there's advocates out there right in, in these groups that are championing causes and you know to be honest right some of them have very um 
there's some selfish tendencies, right? They're trying to fulfill their own interests. Do you think that that's, uh, that's something that the uh, CGPC is going to have to guard against there with this as well? Well, I, I cannot emphasize enough on this. What, what you have mentioned, I mean, this is exactly the point that I have that that concerns me. That we have seen advocates and uh, you know uh, people who tend to be the champions of of certain causes. But look, I mean, if you want to champion a cause, you also want to make sure that you are equipped enough or you are educated enough by yourself. Uh, so that you can champion that cause in an appropriate way rather than being propped up by by you know certain people or for by certain interest groups to you know uh, to propagate a certain narrative that has been one of the concerns and yes i think going forward there has to be a strong guard that has to be placed to protect uh, cgpc against such kind of uh, you know incursions from 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 the advocates who are not really going to be beneficial however they, i i also see uh, a very uh, you know positive sign over here is that you know most of the youth in pakistan um, you know pakistan has i think uh, ma majority of the population is under the age of 30 and maybe 35 i'm not so i mean don't catch me on the on the exact numbers but pakistan has a substantial youth bulge and uh, this youth has access to the knowledge which people back in 20 years did not have and uh, people are debating about issues uh, and they are contesting issues with reason as well. I mean, this is something that was not seen in the yester years. So all the policy elements are debated thoroughly and not in the mainstream media, but I would say in, through the social media and the other ones. I mean, you, you have the noise and the clutter on the social media as well. But despite that, there are people, there are sane people out there wh who reason with the you know who who debate with the reason and who provide solid justification based on facts and understand you know uh, solid understanding rather than what they believe so i think that is uh, a silver lining as well that i see that even though there might be an attempt to you know hijack you know such kind of committees however uh, there is a very strong uh, tendency within the Pakistani society where the ideas are thoroughly debated. I'll give you one example, like Pakistan just released its national security policy, I think just a few weeks back. And uh, people are debating about it on Twitter, on YouTube, and on the other channels. Uh, with the passage of time, the mainstream, the, the viewership of the mainstream media has gone down. But the other unconventional challenges, take the example of YouTube, Twitter, they have been the sources where all these policies are debated thoroughly by the experts and i mean they you know they, they also become a source of education for the folks who are not primarily from this side i'll, I'll give you an example uh, for myself i'm not a person who comes from the economic background side however i mean because of the discussions that we have seen informed debates that we have seen through the unconventional media it has been very informative to understand that what has been the economic issue and how that has impacted the cybersecurity aspect as well. This is why I was saying in the initial phase that when you have the economic crisis and the other governance issues within any country, so cybersecurity takes a back seat and it is not given its due and, uh, you know, attention. So I, I see the silver lining. However, this challenge is, is still relevant. I'll tell you, I'm, a, I'm actually a little envious right now that you're having those that kind of uh, debate openly, right? Uh, you know, I, I look at what's happening here and how policies are going and whatnot, and it's just very few, it's a, almost becomes a who's who. And so, you know, the fact that you you are openly debating that in, in alternative uh, platforms is powerful uh, in that in that society, you know, it is largely interested in it, in, in the implications, right? Um, and I think that's a huge thing is, you know, I look at some of the challenges that we have here in, the, in North America and, and our youth are generally just want to be consumers of technology without all of the burdens, you know, of, and, and they don't really care. And, you know, and it's always kind of been one of these things where I'm like, Knowing what we know about breaches and that there's no such thing as 100% security, right? Because what's secure today 
probably won't be tomorrow. Where do we get to with this like reusable uh, um, type, you know, uh, way that we can just take our digital presence and like, okay, we can dust it off and boom, we just move forward again. So that's all really good stuff. I, I'll tell you, that's that's why I love these uh, these dialogues with our authors here because you will get a lot more insight beyond, you know, what you uh, wrote on. So, you know, you talked about the Pakistani, you know, the challenges and, and, and what kind of drove this. And you gave us some insights about um, the population and, and, and the intelligent conversations that are being had and access to experts, which is all exciting. Um, within the policy, you had written that they named three distinct cha- uh, challenges, right, and risks. Can you just t- touch on those for our listeners real quick? Look, one of the major issues which they mentioned was the ownership itself, uh, because and and again, I can uh, I can sense that based on the challenges that Pakistan government has had in the past 10, 15 years, first of all, being being the issue of terrorism when they when you when you have terrorism all over, I mean, you don't think of the growth and you don't. You, so your entire focus is on how you sustain yourself. So this was one of the major challenges. This kicked in another problem, which was the economic issue. So, and then the governance issues were, so all these issues were getting clubbed. However, uh, even if you set aside these issues, the uh, the realization was there, obviously, within the various Pakistani governments, uh, regardless of who's in power. Uh, but, uh, you know, the challenges that have remained throughout uh, the various governments, one of them, which they have rightly highlighted, is the ownership of the cybersecurity. I mean, to whom... Uh, which ministry manages the, the the cybersecurity, and I mean, who who looks uh, who looks after these these kind of issues, and uh, are these issues you know melting down into the national security policy or not? So these were some of the areas which they mentioned. Again, one of the uh, the first thing was uh, was the ownership issue at the top level, and then once you do not have the ownership of the cybersecurity at the top level, then it kicks in various other issues, which they have mentioned, like the governance and the implementation challenges of cybersecurity policy and strategy. So last year in uh, in April, I remember I was speaking to three chief information security officers and one was the business security officers. I mean, they were from financial sector, uh, three CISOs were from the, from the financial sector and one was from the telecommunication sector. And uh, what we were discussing was that in terms of the governance, because there is a lack of any governance or a regulatory framework in place, so it's an open field for the organizations. I mean, whether they want to comply with it or they don't want to comply it. If they want to comply, if they want to comply with their international best practices, how far do they want to go in, uh, in adhering to those uh, practices? However, for the financial sector, I've seen, uh, and when I spoke to the uh, the folks from the financial sector, they they did advise, they did mention that. In the financial sector, there has been uh, a stronger oversight uh, because of the central bank, obviously, because of the state bank of Pakistan. But again, those uh, those uh, you know th- that oversight was part of uh, was more related to the financial framework, how the financial ecosystem needs to be maintained, and that in itself had some clauses which were relevant to cybersecurity. But there has not been a holistic cybersecurity, rel- uh, you know. Uh, regulatory framework through on based on which you know uh, organizations could have developed its entire governance uh, you know uh, framework and could have pursued its governance goals as well and then the within this they have mentioned that they have had weak info enforcement of the statute so uh, if you see i mean this is more of a cyclical process because first thing is that you have to develop a statute okay and then that statute needs to assign the responsibility to some kind of a regulatory agency which will have to draft the regulations to support that statute so and then comes the part for its enforcement and its adjudication that okay who makes sure who is going to make sure that the regulatory framework which is developed is being enforced upon by all the sectors within the country and who is going to adjudicate this so all these areas were still missing and since you left it to the organizations as well, then, I mean, there is no mechanism or there's no, you know, uh, proper mechanism to determine how, 
whether whether the organizations are continually improving themselves or not so these were the some of the uh, you know intermediate challenges uh, uh, i won't say intermediate i mean these were more of the sub challenges that, that they were facing and the last one was uh, the enforcement uh, again because there is no regulatory framework there is no regulatory guidance and it is left to the to to the judgment of the organizations itself so organizations did what suited them it could have been within their comfort zones or it could have been driven by 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 their entire due diligence practices within the organizations but again it is still left to the organizations and think of the new uh, scenarios now i mean we are living in a world where uh, we don't just have the big corporate organizations right now i mean there is uh, I, i would say there is an immense growth of the startups now i mean how do you make sure that while the startups are very important for the socio economic development within the society and increasing the value creation uh within the society but how do you make sure that they continue to create value in a sustainable manner in a manner where security and privacy challenges are also addressed where they these these uh, you know uh, startups and the new organizations are not creating any kind of a risk which becomes too uh, big for the organization to manage itself so these were the areas these were the challenges that the organization uh, that, that the government has rightly identified uh and they they have classified into three starting from the ownership then the you know the lack of governance and the implementation and the third has been related to the enforcement of the required structures and the processes they mentioned the lack of data governance uh and uh, you know the, these are some of the sub challenges that they have mentioned lack of data governance and also reliance on external resources i feel that the lack of data governance could have been because of the fact that if you do not have the digital transformation Uh, and i mean leave aside the digital transformation but again the importance of data management uh, you know was, was has always been lacking so if the realization uh, around the uh, around the protection of data was not there so i mean you can't expect uh, to have any kind of a governance around the data in itself and uh, then reliance on the on the external resources as well i think in this part uh, the major challenge has been that pakistan does have the human resource it has uh, a valuable re- human resource that it can develop but again in terms of technology yes there has been uh, you know uh, pakistan does have to rely on the external resources and again as much as you rely on the external resources and then it it uh, tends to add a risk on your financial kitty on your economic issues as well Now, you know, you, a couple of really solid points there, uh, you know, is in in tracking, you know, how legislation is done in a lot of places. It just sounds, you know, you're acknowledging all of the challenges that are there, because if the government went out and said, this is what we're going to do, you know, and it's kind of describing what they're going to do. It's not prescribing anything. Right. Like it's very high level. And then that next level down it. it And that's really often from, you know, in the legislation that I've seen around this industry that's fallen down, that's the challenges. It's the interpretation. It's the application like anything else. And, you know, and I just um, I wrote, you know, I just my most recent writing was talking about the accountability piece. Right. And, and, And at the end of the day. This this is really where I just had this epiphany for all of us within industry to kind of because most of us are all credentialed. There's some kind of code of conduct. It's just worthwhile to kind of dust it off and make sure that we're being true to to the profession. And, and you know, and if if there's changes that are out there, then that stuff should be percolating to kind of influence where we're going because um, this is the one common bond. across the globe are some of these global credentials in those of us that are working on the problems. Um you were talking about the the youth, right? And you in relying on external resources is are are the youth that you have interested in technology or 
you know, and, and being part of the, the, being part of the solution, right? The greater cyber, because we often focus on cybersecurity. And, and I think, and, and I want to kind of correlate that, to tie it back to something you wrote about is, is this friction between IT and cybersecurity, right? And we're seeing increasingly everything's infused together, right? So it's very, it's getting increasingly difficult to say, your IT operations and your security, right? Would would you agree with that? Yeah. See, see so the thing is that uh, the, there are two parts to the question that I want to address. First thing is that the youth is, uh, I mean, young people are interested in the technology part. And that is one of my concerns that I have, that just focusing on technology is not important. What is extremely important is that we also focus on the associated governance that is required to run that technology. One thing that we need to, and, and I always emphasize this, that we need technology for a certain objective. That is to create value within the society. That is to attain the socioeconomic development. If we are not doing this, we don't need technology. Period. I mean, and I mean, we were doing business. The, the world was doing business even 30 year, uh, years earlier, even hundreds of years earlier. It's just that when the technology came in, the idea was that you want to streamline the processes, you want to increase the efficiency of the processes, and you want to automate the mundane tasks, and you want to, you know, use the data to run analytics o- over it, and 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 to reach to to certain conclusions which are not based on anecdotal assessments, but on rather data-driven solid assessments. So. The bottom line is that what really matters is the value creation. And for that value creation, you require the technology. Unless IT and cybersecurity do not understand the spot, that we need to, our, our ultimate goal should be value creation. And uh, I would say, I mean, I'll take a critical uh, you know, position for the cybersecurity folks because uh, they, they tend to be too risk averse at times. I feel that, look, our role as cybersecurity consultants should always be to enable the business rather than being a showstopper. The, the goal should be that we enable the business where we tell the business side or the IT side that we are with you in, in enabling the business. However, these are the challenges that we would want you to address. I, I, and I, I feel that, you know, uh, the organizations are not that, uh, I mean, they are not... Uh, Stupid also. I mean, they, they do understand that uh, where the cybersecurity say, what, what cybersecurity is saying, I mean, it, it has certain weightage to it. So, I mean, if you are able to enunciate your, prop, your, your point in a clear manner and with facts, it does help. Uh, however, the bottom line still remains that you, the, this friction be, should not be based on trying to uh, strangulate the business. It should be about how you enable the business. Because once the business kicks in, only then you are going to uh, have the cybersecurity. Businesses do not exist to you know to establish security. For, for businesses, security is an operational risk. That's it. I, I, again, one of the examples that I gave earlier was that, look, if I'm barely able to make my ends meet, if I'm not able to feed my family properly, I would never think of putting a CCTV camera in front of my house and, and having the entire security apparatus around it. I mean, and there's no uh, denying that having the CCTV and the and the adequate security apparatus is beneficial. But okay, the point is that if I'm not able to earn enough money, how can I allocate a certain part of my money to, uh, for the security. So therefore, it's very important that security continues to see itself as the enabler of the business. If we are not doing this, then, I mean, security cannot sustain itself. And we will end up being in this, in, the, in this you know, uh, fighting between the IT and the, and, and the security, and, which is not beneficial for, uh, for, for the overall, uh, you know, community at large. So one, uh, one, I love, first of all, you know, I think you nailed it, creating value w- with regards to technology. And, I, and I, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, right? Just creating a widget for the sake of creating a widget or, or to improve a process. It's like, what problem are we trying to solve? What are the efficiencies? Does it make sense? Because 
I know that there, I, I can look back over the course of the last 10, 20 years, and there's some things we did with technology that didn't work out so well right, at the end of the day. Like you really, we, we know that there were some uh, unintended consequences that just weren't considered. I want to actually just take a step back. Uh, a few minutes ago, you were talking about the, the importance of the, the startups in, in your in that country, right? And I think about that here, you know, in entrepreneurs in general, and they run lean, that, you know, security is is obviously an afterthought. In Pakistan, in Pakistan are those, uh, are those small, uh, you know, companies that, you know, uh, you know, with the entrepreneurs and whatnot, are they supporting larger enterprise or, um, and therefore, then very critical to your supply chain if they are not looking at cyber as a business enabler, or they just kind of fill in some very niche things, and it's just could just be more of a um, a, hin- uh, a a hindrance to your economic growth. So, I mean, it depends on the kind of startups and the entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, the area in which uh, the entrepreneurs are, are working. So uh, let's say if they are part of the sub- certain supply chain, if they are creating value within a certain supply chain, then obviously they have to adhere to the requirements that have been uh, th- that are actually melting down from the top. So in that case, they will have to ad- uh, adhere to the requirements of their customers. Uh, I mean, some of the requirements can be related to the cybersecurity and privacy as well. But the startups that are working independently and that are not essentially part of any supply chain as such, or the or the startups that are trying to resolve the problems that have existed within the society. I mean, for them, uh, I mean, cybersecurity still takes a backseat. I mean, again, and it's understandable for me because these folks are still trying to you know uh, create some value on this and and again this is where the regulatory framework comes in and it has to make sure that uh, these startups are not strangulated and uh, you know because of the cybersecurity and the privacy aspect they should be enabled to create value however in a manner that uh, you know where they where they address the privacy and the cybersecurity risk as well but going back to your initial question, it is still, I mean, on their back burner. It, it does not really take, uh, uh, you know, uh, the front seat for most of the organizations, for, for most of the startups, I would say. Uh, I mean, yes, there would be startups that are uh, that are very concerned about it as well. But if I take a larger picture, I would, I would say it's still on the back burner for them. That's fair. And that's consistent across the board. You know, and it just kind of begs the question, you know, not really a question. It it should prompt what you know the you know the regulatory bodies. It, it, there's almost a responsibility to have like a lean cybersecurity kit, right? And just the bare minimum, you know, a couple things. These are the things you just absolutely need to do. Um, we covered a lot of ground here so far. Is there anything uh, it, with the, the our final minute or so here that you just want to touch on that we didn't cover? That's important for our listeners. You know, what I want to highlight for the listeners is that, look, policy only declares your intent. It only tells that, okay, what the country wants to do in regards to that specific field. So this policy just declares the intent and it touches the right areas that the government of Pakistan wants to address vis-a-vis privacy and cybersecurity because they have talked about the data governance and the online privacy in this one as well. However, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. This is just the initial step that the government has taken. Uh, but still, in terms of the lawmaking, in terms of the regulatory framework, in terms of assigning a regulatory agency that is going to make sure that uh, these uh, regulations are followed across uh, all sectors, I mean, across national level, uh, uh, you know, at, at the national level and also at the provincial levels. Uh, and also, then you need to have a, a sound enforcement and an adjudication mechanism as well, or an audit uh, mechanism where all the organizations are adhering to these uh, regulatory frameworks. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I, you know, I, I only dread that 
this policy uh, you know should not uh, be moved again um, on 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 the back burner uh, pakistan government would would take this and it should move on with this policy that's all the time we have and i'd like to wrap things up by thanking maneev again in taking the time to chat with me and uh, again your contribution to the industry with your article that prompted this podcast thank you uh, for having me it has been a pleasure i always look forward to you know contribute in my capacity uh, towards the towards the you know cybersecurity and the privacy at large not specifically to pakistan but again the idea should be that uh, we should continue to create value within our own domain and uh, because these are i mean uh, you know very important times because we are entering into an era where uh, you know cyber security and privacy are going to be much much bigger subjects and these are going to be taken very seriously at the national level we are already seeing the importance of cyber security and privacy at the by, by the national governments uh, across the globe so therefore it's very important that uh, we as consultants and and as cyber security or privacy professionals that we continue in our capacity to contribute towards this profession well said i'm john brand Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Page to Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode.